April 8th, UFC 287. Here's the lineup. In the main event, middleweight champion, new middleweight champion, Alex Pajeda, puts his title on the line in his rematch against former champ Israel Adesanya. The co-main event, Gilbert Burns versus Jorge Masvidal. Also on the card, we have Raul Rosas Jr., another Contender Series alum. He's only 18 years old, and he's 7-0 after his UFC debut last month. If you are a fight fan, 2023, UFC's 30th year may be the best ever. What's up, guys? Welcome to a brand new episode of DC and RC. I'm Daniel Cormier. That's my boy, Super Bowl champion Ryan Clark. And RC, the boy Dana White is dropping gems, and we're going to get into that. <laughs> but don't go anywhere, guys, because coming up on the show, Ryan and I discuss all that big news that Dana just gave you guys. We also rank our top five athletes in all of mixed martial arts. And as always, we tap in or we tap out. But Ryan, before we can get to Dana's, Dana's news, how you doing, my man? I haven't spoken to you. I have kind of tried to stop bothering you as much as I normally do so I can try to surprise you on the show. And I gave you a bit of a break. How you doing, my guy? <laughs> What's up, man? Listen, bro, I never need a break for you from you. But I'm doing well, man. You know, just trying to get this work done, bouncing around, doing DC and RC, get up, first take, the pivot, NFL Live. But the Super Bowl is coming, and Dana White is dropping so much news, it almost feels like the UFC is giving us a Super Bowl every two weeks. Yeah, they're gearing up. The UFC feels like it's gearing up for a massive year, right? And it's the 30th year in the promotion's history, so – you would expect mm -hmm. them to do it big. Remember 2018 and year 25, you had massive fights. Every time we get to one of those five-year marks, the UFC seems to blow it up. And right now, with the fights that are on the books, I'm talking Makachev, Volkanovski, and now Pajeda versus Edesanya rematch is getting off to a great start in the first quarter. But when you look now, RC, Dana White's got a lot of stuff going. Prime, prime drink, Logan Paul's drink just was announced as the new drink of the UFC. You got the big mm -hmm. fight card happening in Australia. Then you got the big fight card in London. You got Jones coming back. But it's hard not to look at Pajeda versus Edesanya again and get excited. How great was it for you yeah. to hear that news last week? And what was your immediate reaction? It wasn't it, – so it was great because, obviously, I'm a huge Izzy fan. I love the way Alex has been fighting, especially since coming over to the UFC, now being the new middleweight champion. But the excitement was tempered by my son's fear. Uh, Jordan immediately, as soon as I text him and told him about this fight, this is what he put on his story. And he was like, hey, God, it's me again. I know I've been asking for a lot lately, but for my mental wellness, Izzy got to win this one. Please turn him into Kobe Covington by April 18th oh. so he can tackle Cud and lay there for five minutes. Amen. This is the, the trauma that the oh. first Izzy Alex fight put the Clark household into. You got to remember, man, I'm in Pullman, Washington while this fight is on. And Yonk's mm. sleeping in the other bed. I'm watching it on my phone on ESPN+. Plus, <laughs> and I'm cussing, but I'm trying to cuss under my breath as I watch the, found, <laughs> the fifth round come to an end. And so you are extremely excited if you're an Izzy fan. Oh, and obviously, yeah. it's one of the best fights of the year, so you want to see it happen again. But your first thought is, can Izzy really beat Alex, uh, Alex Pereira? And I don't know that he can't. And so this is going to be one of those times where his true championship medal is tested up against a man that almost seems indestructible when you look at how Israel Asanya has fared against him in their first three meetings. RC, you know, I've posed this question on my YouTube channel. What it was, why now? Because for me, RC, anytime you don't hear anything, right, you don't hear Israel talking about whether or not he's going to fight Alex, when he's going to fight. And then all of a sudden, Jamal Hill becomes the champion. And then Jamal Hill says, hell, I'll let Alex Pajeda come up to 205 and I'll fight him right now. But then Alex Pajeda says, Izzy, I won't mess with his plans. If he wants to fight, I'll give it to him. If not, I'll move on to Robert Whitaker. So for me, it feels a little bit like RC, like maybe Izzy wasn't going to fight him now. 
But when his name started to ring bells in so many different areas, he goes, maybe it's now or it may be never. Because as you know, many people feel like Alex is a vulnerable champion because of that glaring hole yes. that Jordan is honestly praying that Izzy exposes, <laughs> right? He thinks that <laughs> he, Izzy can try to expose that wrestling hole that many perceive yeah. Alex to have. So I wonder, and I wonder this aloud, and I'm asking you as my partner and the person that I sit across from every week, do you feel like it's a bit odd that the timing and the announcement happens right after it seems as though Alex's name is ringing bells? Because the one thing you don't want is the person that you're scheduled to fight or the person that is supposed to be your next dance partner to have too many girlfriends lining up to dance across from him because then it gets a bit scary. So does it feel like that's why Izzy's yeah, saying right now it has to happen? You know, you know what? I don't know necessarily if Izzy is saying it happens. It has to happen right now. But if you're the UFC, wouldn't you want it to happen right now? If there is that glaring hole in Alexis' game, if you if we do remember, I believe it was the third round that Izzy was able to control him on the ground in that fight. Would you want to put him in there with a a wrestler? Would you want to put him in there with yeah, yeah. a premium grappler before? And then he loses, and in that guy now being crowned champion, it doesn't have the glitz or the glamour of the gold of Israel being champion or Alex being champion. And so it's the smart move to make to me for the UFC. And that's why I believe it's happening right now as opposed to seeing it pushed down the road in the future. I think the other piece of it is too, you know, we've seen Jamal, who has just been crowned the new light heavyweight champion, have some back and forth with Alex. And that could be a fight that I believe people would be excited to see when you're talking about two of the most dynamic strikers in the entire sport. And so I think for Israel Adesanya and for Alex, for, for Alex, I always mess this name up, Pereira, it's something that has to happen now because I believe as he goes down the line and he seen to be more vulnerable, no one will necessarily have the excitement that they'll have around seeing Izzy fight him for the second time in the octagon, which will be happening in April. You know, I agree with that completely. I agree with putting him in there with Adesanya in the biggest fight. But it, it, like I said, it just feels like it's happening on his terms because here's the deal. Adesanya has been the champion for so long, RC, that he does not need to fight right now. Financially, Izzy could sit for years. He's one of the highest paid athletes in the UFC. But for Hayda, a young champion and a guy that hasn't been there as long, dude's got to keep stacking the chips. So he has to get going. He can't sit from November to November and not have a fight. He wants to make his money. He wants to make his money as the champion. And it feels like they're happening. But I think with all the things surrounding, I have two questions. One, <clears throat> Where's the fight happening? Where's the fight happening in April? There were rumors that the UFC wanted to be in New York twice next, next, next year, in 2023. Does that happen in New York? There were rumors that the UFC wanted to be down south, maybe Miami. Got Masvidal on the card. That, is that one of the things? And if it happens in New York, how does Adesanya respond if the fight is in Madison Square and everything looks so familiar? If there's anyone that can handle that I believe it's the last style bender because if you watch the fight um RC he was winning and and we'll get to our list later and there's gonna be I'm gonna prove a point on why a guy is so high on my list based on the fact that even though he lost he was winning the fight how does is yeah. he handle all those things but ultimately when we're past all those things inside of the matchup Edison is still favored to regain the championship yeah I think though when you listen to Israel Adesanya speak about this fight, even after he lost, he kept saying, I know I can beat him. He kept saying, I've been in there with him. And if you look at the second fight, I was winning on the cards. If you look at the third fight, obviously, in the octagon, when Alex was able to take the UFC middleweight championship from him, he was winning on the cards. And so to him, it's about just surviving that last round because he believes he's the better fighter. He believes he's the more skilled fighter. But has it gotten to a point where he can't hurt Alex enough? He can't put him away. And as long as he's standing, he has a chance to put Izzy out because that's what we 
saw in their first meeting inside the UFC. Are you surprised, though, DC, with giving – with given the record of these two teams, with I mean not two teams, I'm thinking so my mind yeah, just went guy. to so <laughs> so my mind just went to Kansas City, Cincinnati, right? Because Kansas City had been beaten by Cincinnati the last three times. Joe Burrow was three and zero against Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs, and then going into this last meeting, Patrick Mahomes is banged up. But they're still slight favorites, I believe, going into the game against the Cincinnati Bengals. And now seeing Israel Adesanya being 0-3 against the champion, but also still being favorite, what does that tell you about the odds makers or about the way they felt the first fight went? And do you agree with Israel Adesanya being the favorite? I think what it tells me, RC, is that they think – that Alex only wins by finishing him, and Adesanya, over the course of a long fight, should win. But the reality is they've only gone to the cards one time, and Alex Pajeda won the decision. Every other time, he's finished him. So it's hard to say when you can have two guys that have interacted three times, and one guy has won all three times, that he is the underdog. But we know what the last style bender is. We know what Israel Adesanya is. We know how dominant. We know how explosive. We know how special... He can be inside the octagon. We just also know that there's a bit of a hang-up with Alex Pajeda. I think that mentally, he's going to have to find a way to get past those moments where doubt starts to set in. Because even as a great champion, RC, and you know, and you've experienced this, that even as you guys, the Pittsburgh Steelers, were the best defense, there were teams that just could compete against you, and you knew that it would be very difficult to make it happen. Those moments, those slight moments of doubt are compounded in fighting because in those slight moments of doubt is when you can get finished. It ain't just one touchdown. It's not one missed tackle. It's you getting your lights put out. And I think Izzy will have to deal in those moments where he goes, how do I get to the final bell knowing that I can outpoint this guy without getting caught with something mm -hmm. that's going to end my night? And that's one of the things that I think is going to be so key with him as he approaches this fight. Do I believe for one second that this guy doesn't think he's going to win? No. I think he's special. I think he has an ironclad mind, and he believes he'll get it done. But Alex Pajeda is, is, is the next level. We don't see guys going 7-1 and one in their whole career and being the UFC champion. It's just yeah. unheard of. This guy's special. Well, um, RC, but that's not the only fight. Also, also I'm sorry, that's not hold the on one second, though, DC. DC, and, mm -hmm. and even in saying he's special and he's only 7-1, I think that is to almost ignore that the what's special about him is the Izzy side of it. It's not that mm -hmm. I, I don't feel like Alex yeah. gets rushed to this opportunity or gets this opportunity or is pushed to this opportunity if that champion isn't Israel Adesanya. I don't believe that. I believe mm -hmm. making this matchup was of priority to the UFC. And the UFC also knew that they couldn't Continue to put Alex in there with people who could possibly beat him or could possibly take him down. He didn't have to go through the gauntlet that Israel Adesanya had to go through in order to be champion because people wanted to see that fight. They wanted to see Alex yeah, versus yeah, yeah. Israel Adesanya. So even though we're saying he is special because he is, right, the reason mm -hmm. he is the champion now is because people wanted to see that fight in particular, and now when seeing that fight, he was able to beat Israel Adesanya and become the middleweight champion. Mm -hmm. You know, RC, and that's, that's honestly, that's the, that's the truth, but that thought right there, honestly, is why and what motivates Pajeda, right? What motivates Pajeda and makes him think at that level is because the vast majority sees it as that. And you're right. I don't think for one second that he could have won three fights in the UFC and fought anyone else but Israel Adesanya. You are absolutely yes. right. But that serves as motivation for that man. Because even though that man is one of the greatest kickboxers of all time, his name was built because Izzy became the UFC champion. He had beaten Izzy twice. He's the UFC champion now because people believe he was given matchups that favored him to get him to Adesanya. So it's like it serves as motivation for this guy. You know, after the game last weekend, the, the chief said, the, bang, uh, the Bengals gave a lot of bulletin board material. Every time someone says that about Alex, every time someone says he can't defend the takedown, dude just is just tacking it up on the board, RC, and he's just watching it, and it serves to motivate him to win those fights. And, 
again, that is why people think he's fighting Izzy now so that he doesn't lose. But the worst thing for him would be to lose, to win this fight again and then in the next fight lose to someone else because they'll just go, well, he just can beat Adesanya. So this guy has a ton of proving to do to people to truly make them believers <laughs> in who he is as the UFC champion. But RC, like I said, well, that's not the only fight that was announced. Jorge Masvidal accepted the fight against Gilbert Burns. They're fighting. It's one that seems to have been in the making for a long time. Masvidal accepts. I can't imagine that he accepted this fight based on Burns beating Neil Magny in the way that he did. So right. for me, I wonder what made him accept this fight now. It's another one of those things where the timing to me, like why fight him right now? You know, I, I don't really know. I, I feel like Jorge Masvidal doesn't want to put himself back in the place of journeyman fighter where he's not fighting against opponents or not fighting on cards or not fighting in situations that continue to keep his name in the spotlight. I don't believe that he's ready to fade off into the fighting the 10th through the 15th rank, ranked welterweight. Mm. And so Gilbert Burns is still an opportunity to put yourself in fighting the top five. It's going to be a fight that's going to be extremely difficult and a fight people expect him to lose. I believe Gilbert Burns has opened as a five to one favorite to win this fight. And let's truly look at who Jorge Masvidal is before he had his run in the UFC, which put him or gave him the opportunity to lose to Kamaru Usman twice. This was a fighter that was struggling to gain relevancy. It was the, the BMF that was created because of the, the, the flying knee off of the cage early on to, to put an end to a fight because, you know, you beat Steven Wonderboy Thompson. And so there were all these things that went on that gave him sort of this momentum. Since then, and since being in the octagon with elite talent, Jorge Masvidal has not only not won fights, he hasn't looked great. He has never been back to that dynamic fighter that brought him to that point. And so in fighting against a Gilbert Burns, one, it's a risk, but it's also showing that now Gilbert Burns has put himself in a position where I'll fight anybody. There is no fear in me. Mm -hmm. There is no running from the octagon from anyone. You give me a guy. You give me a name. I'll fight him because I want an opportunity to be welterweight champion again. But if you're Jorge Masvidal, DC, what does this fight do if you lose it? Where the, does this now put him? RC, can I say this before I get into this? I want to say something. This is why I love you. Like, you say... What very few MMA people will say that you go back and you look at who he was prior and you will say, hey, man, this dude was a journeyman. You say when he yeah, got to the yeah. elite of the elite, he got put back into a category where he just hasn't proven or shown that he can compete yep. with the elite of the elite in a division. So it's like not many people in this sport will say that. I will say it because I'm secure and I get attacked all the time for it. And I, but I'm secure in all that I've done. You'll see it. Yeah. And that's why you yeah. take someone that comes into the sport and has nothing to gain by friendships, right? A lot of people base their opinions on friendships. Yeah. I love that, bro, because that's what most people Appreciate will say. It, bro. And remember, Nate Diaz was mad at you because you said the same type of thing. Everybody says, yeah. won't say the things that are true in these situations. And Appreciate that's true. That, bro. Masvidal yeah. is fighting Gilbert Burns in a situation, RC, where he's number 11. He's a 5-1 to one underdog. And if he wins... He exceeds expectation. If he doesn't, it's kind of something that's supposed to happen. And I think that's why for so long he was hesitant to take this fight. Okay. To get to your question, RC, it's must win. There is no doubt about it. You win, I mean, you don't go home because there's still going to be some star quality to him. But you win or you go back to that place from prior. You go back to that place where... You're fighting guys like Ally Aquinta, and you're fighting guys uh, like Michael Chiesa, who we love, but you're not fighting the Kobe Covingtons and the Kamaru Usmans and the Gilbert Burns of the world because, you know, we only get so many opportunities to stand aside or amongst the greatest in the world. So for Jorge, man, he's got to get it done. And let me tell you something. Jorge Masvidal and I have had things publicly said between us, but in person, Dude's a complete gentleman. I have nothing against him in terms of who he is as a man and how he carries himself. He's Puerto Rican. He always asks about my wife and my children. He's a great guy. Like, he is a great guy, and I hold nothing against 
But if you look just in the numbers, uh, five to one dog, ranked number 11 in the world, mm -hmm. fight number five. This is a hard ask for him. And it, it's do or die. Because if you don't win this one after losing to those other two guys in the top five, I don't know where you go. Yeah, and, I, and, and, that's, the, and that's what's the, the hard part for Jorge Masvidal. I will say this. You take the Gilbert one Burns fight question, before RC, you take... One quick question, RC. Okay, yep. Let me ask you this real quick, my brother. I'm sorry to cut you off. Is Jorge Masvidal yeah. in a situation now, though, like Nate Diaz, where I may be overstating it, like it doesn't matter if he wins or loses, where people just kind of still tap in? Or has he not gotten to that point? Because Diaz, it don't matter what Diaz does. Yeah, see, I don't, I don't think that Jorge Masvidal has gotten to that point because I don't believe... And, and, and it's going to be weird to use this word to describe Nate Diaz. I don't think he has the charisma that Nate Diaz has. For mm -hmm. all of the antics, for the, the cursing, for all of that, there's something that draws you in to Nate Diaz. It's almost that the aggression has somehow become endearing to people when you look at Nate Diaz. For the way Jorge Masvidal is, it has to be attached to winning. It has to be attached to showing that when I step into the octagon, it's not about the three-piece I could give Leon Edwards after the interview, right? It's not about the fact that I could tap the mat after I knock Ben Askren out. It was attached to the fact that when I went into the octagon, I was showing people that I had elite-level skills, elite-level striking, and with that striking, you can put me in there with the Kamaru Usmans. You can put me in there with the Kobe Covingtons. But these are men who have now dominated Jorge Masvidal. Mm -hmm. And so he doesn't have the charisma outside of that that I believe draws people into him. His story is not a story that makes you say, I want to see this dude win or lose. And so that's why, to me, the Gilbert Burns fight is important because he needs to come out. And I don't believe he needs to win, DC, but I do believe it needs to look like Hamzat Chimaev versus Gilbert Burns if he loses. Mm -hmm. It can't be Neil Magny. It can't be Kobe Cummington. It can't be the knockout of Kamaru Usman. I believe if that happens, we don't talk about nor hear about Jorge Masvidal going forward. Because let's be real. His losses aren't Michael Chandler losses. Mm. No. You know, RC, I think, I think, I think it's probably because it was, for Diaz, it, it was sustained, right? From the ultimate fighter yes. all the way to fighting for the belt, fighting Connor, winning against Connor. It was like sustained. Yes. And for Masvidal, it was like a, a, a short window, right? It was, it was there until Ben Askren, Nate Diaz, and I think it was all within a year where he went from that place of he's a good fighter to the moon. And I think that's probably why I agree with you, that he doesn't have that star attractiveness that will sustain losing four fights in a row, he will get pushed down the card. But I think there's always going to be something to him because he does draw people in. He's got the background. You remember, the, you know, he flew to PJ, but stopped in Italy to get pizza to fight Kamaru Usman on three days. There's something to it. I just don't know if it's at that level. But as we start to kind of see these matchups, right, we got Usman versus Edwards again. And I also think Jorge is very smart taking this a month after Usman Edwards because if Leon wins and he wins, he might find himself fighting Leon Edwards due to the two-piece in the biscuit. But one guy that's, like, missing is Kobe Covington. What about 1A yep. or 1B? He's been 1B for so long. What about Kobe? Is he going to be fighting Bilal Muhammad next? Like, is he going to fight Hamzat? Like, what does all this do for Kobe Covington? Where is Kobe Covington? I feel like Kobe Covington's in that odd place of having fought Kamaru Usman two times and, and losing. And that not putting you in the spot to get an opportunity to fight for the title before Kamaru Usman gets his rematch. Also, what happens if Kamaru does regain the title? Is Leon Edwards in a position to ask for a rematch? My thoughts on that would be if Kamaru dominates this next fight the way he did for four, four rounds in the last fight, then Leon's actually not in that place. But then do we see Hamzat Chemaev get the opportunity, who many people believe could be the best welterweight in the entire world? Kobe Covington needs activity. Now, 
We also know he's dealing with some things that happen away from the octagon with him and Jorge Masvidal. So maybe that's a reason that he hasn't been back in there to fight. But if he's coming back, is it Bilal Muhammad? Is it Hamza Chemaev? And obviously Gilbert Burns has an opponent right now. We need to see Kobe Covington again. We need to see Kobe Covington be dominant again, I believe, before he gets that next title shot. So this idleness is probably troublesome to him and his camp because it has him in no man's land. Yeah, he's just, he's kind of just floating, right? And it seems as though the division now is starting to move around him. But we can't forget, I'm not mistaken, and Jake, maybe you could kind of whisper this in my ear, guys. We have these things in our ears, but when we need help with something, they kind of tell us. But I think Kobe's last fight, he beat Jorge Masvidal, right? Like, I don't know if that was before yes, that or after was the, last the Usman one. fight. But that I was think the last he fight. won. Like, he won his last fight. So it's like, but time has passed, right? Right after he beat him, with Leon, that was becoming the champion. If Kamara didn't take the fight, we could have been like, well, I mean, Kobe's long been 1B, but time is passing. Right. And being idle isn't the best thing for a guy in a division that's constantly moving. But the moment Kobe Covington starts to reinsert himself, he'll be loud, he'll be boisterous, he'll have a lot to say, and people will start to pay attention. And then right away, he's back relevant. Because we have not seen anyone but Kamara Usman for a really long time Solve the puzzle that is Kobe Covington. So I think he'll be relevant for a while, but I think he needs to get rolling again because momentum is key in this sport. And when you don't have momentum, nobody's really checking for you. And I think Kobe Covington needs to make sure he doesn't find himself in that place where he is in no man's, no man's land out on an island by himself. But RC, one guy that does have momentum is the 17-year-old Raul Rosas Jr., he Man, had as good of a UFC debut as you could have asked for. But now he's saying he's going to be a three-division champion. And I told you, it might be youthful ignorance, right? We all know at 18 or 17, I, don't, I mean, the kid's 17 or 18. I don't know how old he is. I think he's 18. But he goes, I'm ready to go out there and show my skill set like I've always done. Tune in April 8th. I'm going to show my skills and show that I deserve to fight for a title right now. That, to me, youthful ignorance. But, Ryan... When you really look at the kid, what should the expectations be? I think the expectations are sky's the limit. DC, he's in a he's in the spot of, and we all know that BJ Penn was the original <laughs> prodigy, right? But this yeah. dude really is a prodigy when you look at him, DC. Um, and people who watch our show are probably not old enough to remember Doogie Hauser, right? Doogie Hauser yeah, was a doctor who was a <laughs> teenager because he was so smart because he was so advanced and that was the reason it was so crazy to people but it's the same thing with Rosas Jr. like this is an 18 year old who is in the octagon with grown men and when you think about his first fight he was absolutely dominant and he dominated a man who who threatened to absolutely put his lights out he's been training for this his entire life the same way and and not in the same way you trained for it, DC. You were a wrestler, an elite wrestler who yep. was able to make the jump to gain the requisite skills outside of wrestling to be a champion. This kid has been preparing for this particular sport, this particular stage, his entire life. And so I think it's almost impossible for us to lay the expectations on him because we've truly never seen this, right? Once we got an opportunity to see John Jones, that was sort of that difference that we saw in, okay, he's the jump in athleticism, along with a guy like George St. Pierre. Well, Rosas Jr. is that next step from a guy like A.J. McKee, who was built to do this his entire life. And so, D.C., from someone who's been in the game, watching a young man excel at such a young age, won't you talk about what could be some of the pitfalls of the expectations of entering the game mm -hmm. the way that he has? R.C., you made such a great point there how we haven't seen that, so it's hard to really say what he can be. Because in football, yeah. it's like seven-on-seven, seven, right? We start to prepare the elite-level yep. kids by playing seven-on-seven seven football and then getting a trainer. Yep. And then they start to advance through age. We've never had an MMA fighter 
where he knows striking as a kid, he knows grappling as a kid, mm-hmm. he knows wrestling as a kid. He has just trained for it. So you don't know. You knew, R.C., that when Christian McCaffrey graduated high school, he had had everything done to prepare himself to be a pro running back, probably an all-pro running back. He just, he had it. They had trained him to be that. That is what we have in Raul Rosas Jr., a kid that has been trained to be a, an elite mixed martial artist. Now, I don't know if he's going to be a three-division champion. I can't put a label because, like you said, I've never seen it. But what I have seen is young guys come into the game with an abundance of confidence, with a boatload of being self-assured and understanding mm-hmm. what they can do in a belief that they are the best in the world. But I would like to see him in there with Aljamain Sterling. Those videos that Aljo talked mm. about when they were training and how the dad was filming, I'd like to see how he did against that next level because there's like a level right. of fighter that's UFC level, and then there's the top 15, and there's the top 10, mm-hmm. and then like there's the top five, and they're like this, right? It's like yep. there's a massive difference in the elite of the elite and the other guys inside the octagon. I worry that being so young, you move too fast. And when you move Mm. too fast, I don't know if you ever recover. Because if he goes in there and he gets wiped out by getting into the top 10 competition too early, I don't know if you recover. Because you know that as young kids, we make mistakes, and then you learn from those mistakes. Unfortunately, He can't make mistakes inside the octagon and learn from them because the damage done inside the octagon can be so great. I know that when he made his debut, I sat next to Sean Shelby and Mick Maynard, and we were all worried because worst case scenario is having an 18-year-old kid in there with a grown man, Ryan, and just getting his ass kicked the entire time. It would be a horrible visual. Yes. DC, and and honestly, the, the visual will be attached to his age. Right. The 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 fathers in the crowd who watch like myself and like you, the mothers in the crowd who watch. It's going to be hard for them to pull those paternal instincts away from wanting to protect Rosas Jr. And I think that's the worry you have. The other thing is this, though, D.C., I think about myself at 18 and then I think about myself at 30. The level of knowledge (laughs) I had not only in football, just in life, right, is so different. Also, also the intensity in which I could focus on things were so different. And when people talk about grown man strength, that's actually a real thing, DC. Grown man strength (laughs) is a real thing. As you you mature, right, as you mature, when I grab your arm and you my kid, it's different when I'm 18. And it's different when I'm 30. And so I think about all those things when we speak about his matchups or his maturation process and the opportunities he has for opponents. I believe that he has to be smart and his team, even though he is ahead of the game, and also the UFC. Another guy who's been extremely smart throughout his entire MMA career is Max Holloway. But Max Holloway is coming off of a loss to Alexander Volkanovsky, and he's going to be, or at least there are talks in the works about him fighting against Arnold Allen, who was kind of robbed of his glory against Calvin Cater when he had an opportunity to truly ascend, right, in the featherweight ranks. When you look at this matchup, and that is being targeted for April 15th, there's two things we know about April 15th that'll be, right? That it's as sure as taxes that this fight will also be (laughs) explosive. How excited are you to see Max Holloway back in the octagon? Very excited. I think that anytime Max Holloway gets inside a UFC fight, I'm pumped to the moon. I love Max Holloway. He's my friend, and I care for him dearly. And I know that Arnold Allen is going to be a fantastic matchup for Max Holloway. I think it's going to be a fun fight. It'll be amazing. But my worry as a friend, RC, is... How long can Max Holloway just keep batting off these hungry young lions? Like, how long can he fight these guys that are so good and so young and continue to 
stop them. Because at some point, like, you know, time catches up to all of us. And I wonder how long before my buddy starts to slow down. I, I don't think that's now. I think he did the right thing by taking some time after last year, after Volkanovski. But I just recall the 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 fight with Yair Rodriguez and Max having to wrestle yeah. and do all those things to really propel himself forward. Obviously, he made those adjustments. But I just wonder how long till he... Uh, those kids start to become so difficult. Um, Max Holloway is going to be ready. He's going to be prepared. You know, we talked about him coming up here to train with me a little bit. I hope he still does that. I'm excited about the Arnold Allen fight. I'm excited about my friend getting another opportunity to challenge him. But I also know that Arnold Allen is on the cusp or has an opportunity once again to not only have his moment in the sun, but excel. Even the opportunity he had against Calvin Cater because of what Max Holloway has been to this division. You know what, DC? And this is a question I have for you that I certainly can't answer. And I don't even know if you can answer it totally because I can't remember you being in this spot once you reach the pinnacle of the UFC. Max Holloway has been fighting the last, I don't know, half decade to prove that he's the best in the world at what he does, right? You've been fighting the Alexander Volkanovskis. You fought the Dustin Poiriers. You fought the Conor McGregor. So you're always fighting at the top of the sport. After losing three times to Alexander Volkanovski, he has had to accept and we've had to come to grips with, he's actually not the best featherweight in the world. Right? Like, we've had to accept that. Mm -hmm. And so now, in fighting Arnold Allen, you're taking a step down. This is not a championship-level fight, at least from a perception standpoint. How much does that weigh into the excitement of a fighter and the focus of a fighter when you're stepping into the octagon and what would be considered a level down for you when you're of the, the, the tier that Max Holloway is? You know, crazy that you can look at an Arnold Allen fight as a tear down, but like you said, all Max has ever done is fall for championship. So not having a belt on the line would seem to be a step back, but it's not necessarily a step back in competition. It's being in a position now where you have to prove that you still belong in the championship picture. Honestly, I I asked Sean Shelby a couple weeks ago, I said, why not Holloway versus the Korean zombie or somebody like that, right? Because, like you said, he's had to accept that right now or at any more, he's not the best featherweight in the world because Alexander has beaten him three times. But he has to go out now and fight a guy that hasn't been where he's been. So the focus has to be as dialed in as it was going into those championship fights, if not more. Because in fighting Volkanovski, you are fighting a guy that has at least proven to you that he is on your level in regards to championship experience and everything else. Now you're fighting a guy that has not slept in the presidential suite at hotels. He has not been picked up his entire or his entire MMA career with the black car, getting the, the red carpet rolled out for him everywhere he goes. And in that, those guys are even more scary because they want that so bad. They have not had the satin sheets. They have not had the red carpet treatment their entire life. you got to be locked in. It's going to be as difficult as anything he's ever done. And and I think that's the other piece of it, too, though, DC, is that Arnold Allen is going to have to see this as the next big stepping stone. It's you're in the octagon with one of the greats of all time to do it. And you understand what getting that name on your resume with the W next to it means not only for the moment, but for your future, for your perception, for your career. And I think that's what's so scary about taking a fight against a young, talented, hungry fighter like Arnold Allen, who is ranked number four, but obviously wants to be higher. And speaking of rankings, we're going to do some rankings of our own, DC. And we're going to talk a little bit about the top pound-for-pound fighters in the entire world. And here is six through ten. We're also going to show you one through five. And in this top ten, they picked it with Islam, Volk, Valentina, Dennis Hamzat, Kamaru Usman. We saw that Izzy 
was at number six, so on and so forth. You go down to John Jones, Francis Ngannou, uh, Zhang Wei Li, and then Alex Pereira uh, rounding it out at number 10. DC, who's going to be your top five of the MMA rankings? You know, RC, I got my phone out dancing? because I got my rankings on there. And I like, you hear that beat? I mean, do you hear that? Like, hey, what is that? Jake, he's probably going to go to six. Just be ready. No, no, for sure. No, for sure. No, I'm not. Number five, I got Hamza Chumayev. I think Hamza Chumayev okay. right now has proven what pound for pound is. He's been fighting in multiple weight classes. He has not been just a welterweight. He's fought at middleweight. He's had success there. He, he's tremendous. Number four. I got to go Valentina Shevchenko because, once again, she has proven. She has fought Amanda Nunes close twice at 135. All she has done is win. So at number four, another fighter that has proven pound for pound. Now I get into the part of the rankings where guys have stayed at their weight class. But at number three, Kamaru Usman. He was easily Hmm. the number one pound for pound fighter in the world. And then he lost to Leon Edwards. But in that fight, R.C., 30 more seconds. He had would have dominant. And would they have stayed on top of the mantle as the number one pound for pound fighter in the world? So I have Kamar Usman. At number two, Islam Makashev. Even though ESPN has him number one, I have Islam number two because guess what? Alexander Volkanovsky, who is my number one, so they kind of run together, has not done anything to go down. His last performance was against <laughs> exactly. Max Holloway, and he looked like an absolute exactly. killer. So how does Islam <laughs> yeah. Makashev pass him when he's done nothing? But when? It's like Islam had a great performance yeah. against Charles Oliveira, but was it more impressive than what Alexander did to Max Holloway? Absolutely not. Alexander Volkanovsky is still number one for me. Well, so I'm going to go at number five. I'm going to go Israel Adesanya. He was also someone that was very high in the pound-for-pound rankings before losing his title in his last fight. And when you think about that fight, he truly dominated Alex throughout that fight he was winning on the scorecards you lose with a tko in the fifth round at number four i'm going to go kamaru uzman for all the reasons that you did as well dc this is a guy who was easily number one was on their way to tying anderson silva for the most consecutive wins in the ufc had truly dominated his weight class had beat the top guys even already beating um leon edwards who is now the champion at number three, I'm going to go Islam Mahachev there. I do believe that he has proven that he is one of the best in the world, no matter the weight class, no matter the fighter. But it's still a little too early for me to put him over Valentina Shevchenko, who I have at number two, who's consistently and constantly proving, proven that she is the queen of the flyweight division. And you also mentioned moving up to 135 and giving Amanda Nunes all she could handle twice. And at number one, it's Alexander Volkanovsky for me too, because he has done nothing to say to the world that he isn't the best, not only at his weight class, but the best pound for pound, especially with the dominance of Max Holloway in their third fight. Absolutely. RC, I good. have no problem Mine with your looks list. better than yours though. I, I, I was Mine just looking looks at that picture like, what is this picture? Where did they find this, dog? That's young RC. This? That's young RC. I was like 36 <laughs> right there, brother. You see the part? That boy got the part, the edge up, R- a little bit further down the forehead. You see it? You see it? <laughs> I see it, RC. Hey, Usman not only is on the pound for pound list as a fighter, he is one of the pound for pound best dressed in the entire world. And I see your, I see your outfit today. You are looking pretty sharp. I like the blue blazer. Thank you, I like the little, like, Thank that's you, not even a full turtleneck. That's like one of those little half turtleneck things that a, only skinny people turtleneck. with long necks can wear, you know? It's a mock it's turtleneck. A mock you got to have a long, skinny neck yeah, to wear that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> hey, man, let's tap into the top before you RC. keep making fun of me. <laughs> All right, guys. Derek Lewis is back in action this weekend in the main event, facing off against Sergey Spivak. Derek Lewis is on a two-fight losing streak and has never lost three in a row. RC, tap in or tap out. Lewis snaps his losing streak this weekend. I tap out. Uh, I am slowly losing faith in in Derek Lewis. And I think it's the way he's been losing. He's fighting people who are no longer scared to strike with him. And they're putting him down. And putting him down in ways that makes him look like he's wilting under the pressure of the striking. And that's not something we're used to seeing happen with Derek Lewis. RC, I I really kind of like, I agree with you, but I don't know if Spivak is the guy. I don't, I I don't know if, 
And then I'm trying not to like insult Sergey Spivak because I like the kid. I think he's a nice guy. I think he's a good fighter. I just like remember what I said earlier about the levels of top five to top yep. ten. He's still losing the yep. guys that are ranked very highly, and I just don't know if Sergey is like quite at that level. So I I'm gonna tap in that Derek Lewis wins the fight. I, I think he's gonna knock very, him out. You don't look but very I do confident. Believe you don't that, look very confident. No, I, I know I RC and I ain't. I'm not. But I just don't know. I know I think Derek's done at the top. I think Derek's absolutely okay. done at the top of the division. I just don't know if he still can't knock out 10, 11, 12, 13. Because I just don't think those guys are, you know, are as good as as they are they are. Uh but also, hey, quick shout out RC Lars Senko for the first time in modern UFC yeah. history. A woman is calling the fights this weekend. She's doing color commentary Congrats. for the first time. So hats off to Lars Senko. Congratulations. Her hard work is being uh yep. appreciated and she's getting an opportunity to do something truly special. So congrats, she's gonna Laura. Kill it. Have fun this weekend. It is a fantastic job. It's all fun. Corporate Jake, let's go. I guess rumors were swirling over the weekend that Conor McGregor and Tony Ferguson were offered to coach against one another in the upcoming season of The Ultimate Fighter. DC, tap in or tap out on McGregor-Ferguson tough coach season. So I tap in, but like I got, got this question like, what's Tony going to do about his school? I don't know, RC. You saw, you know, Tony goes to Harvard. I don't know if you saw the video Harvard, a couple man. weeks ago. Tony had a Harvard. Yeah. Yeah, he go to Harvard. Like, what are you going to do about his school? Harvard would not <laughs> seem like a school that you could just leave for six weeks to go coach the ultimate fighter. But I absolutely tapped in. I think it would be funny uh, to see Tony Ferguson and Conor yeah. McGregor doing the show. But also, that's a fight Conor McGregor could win when he came back. I, that That is why I tap in, DC. I tap in on those two personalities being coaches on the show and I also tap in on the Conor McGregor return fight being Tony Ferguson which sets him up with a win for a fight that we could see that be even more explosive with a guy like Mike, Michael Chandler. Go ahead Corporate Jake. The UFC has officially gotten into the NIL game. They have signed former UFC champion Frank Mir's daughter Bella Mir as their first NIL athlete ambassador. RC tap in or tap out on the UFC getting into the NIL space. I tap in on it. UFC is one of the fastest growing sports in the entire world, not just this country. And so if you have an opportunity to put your stamp or put your name on some collegiate athletes or high school athletes who are coming up and who one day might be a part of your brand, I think it's perfect for marketing, also perfect for giving back. And look, you have someone that's a legacy in Bellamere. Yeah, I, I absolutely tap in RC and all. Hey, that name carries intrigue. That name has cachet, yeah. right? She's a mirror. She's a former UFC champion's daughter, and she is an absolute yeah. beast. I remember I met Bella last year, RC, when she was a senior in high school. Dana called me into his office, told me that Bella had interest in going into the University of Iowa, one of the better uh, first Division I women's programs. Clarissa Chun, the head coach there, is doing a tremendous job. All in Iowa is one of the most traditional rich schools in NCAA yes. wrestling history. I put her in contact with the coach. The coach saw it, was like, I want this girl. She's an absolute savage, an absolute beast. It is a perfect partnership, and she is the perfect athlete to be the UFC's first. Yep. Corporate Jake. Hey, Dana, one. they got a kid at Arizona State that loves UFC, too. You know, if you just want to yeah, yeah. go into the NIL yeah, We got a couple, football. RC. We got a couple that we need <laughs> NILs for. We got a couple, Dana White. All right, guys. <laughs> Cheeto Vera and Charles Oliveira recently decided to fill out their back tattoos. Cheeto got a giant rooster, which represents he's growing up, going to rooster fights, while Charles got a giant lion. DC, tap in or tap out. Charles has the better back tattoo. Mm. Well, Charles got the better back. Like, look at Cheeto's back. Cheeto back look like <laughs> Cheeto back look like an old ass man back. Like his back kind of small. Like, why Cheeto back look so small? <laughs> hey, hey, hey! Cheeto, Cheeto got the back of a librarian. <laughs> like, what kind of <laughs> back is that? <laughs> <laughs> ah, I, tap in. I tap in that Charles has a better tattoo, man, just because Charles got a better Ooh. back than my boy Cheeto, dog. I don't know if it's Cheeto's hat. Hey, I don't know what is making Cheeto back look like that, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, I'm going to tap in on Charles, but both of these tattoos are live, man. And that's a ton of work for both of these dudes to get on their back tats, man. So I love them both. <laughs> but I tap in on Charles with the line. Hey, DC, bro, you're going to get me beat up, man. <laughs> Bro, 
Bro, you can laugh at these dudes and make fun of them. I can't. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I'm walking around T-Mobile Arena at fight week and I get stole on, I'm just stole on. And then I'm going to be choked out in front of y'all and the kids. I got you, my brother. I got you. 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 I got you, what RC. What you doing like, this weekend, keep bro? Keep it coming, bro. You ain't got to call no fights. No, I'm going. You ain't got to call no fights. I'm actually, we starting our, we start, we're starting our league wrestling competition this year, the Gilroy Mustangs. We're on our chase to the state championship. It starts this weekend. Okay. I need some positive. Little Daniel, dog, last weekend I took Daniel to Washington, D.C. I had a beautiful trip with my son. All the history, he understands it. It was tremendous, man. I had a great time, RC. What about you? What you got going on? Hey, man, you know what, man? I'm going out to the Pro Bowl for the beginning of, I mean, for the end of the week. Then I'm going to go home and get geared up for the Super Bowl. We will be back next week. And remember, you can watch us wherever you watch your podcast at 12 a.m. on ESPN2. I'm RC. That's my dog, DC. And we are DC and RC. Keep tapping in. Keep tuning in. Appreciate y'all.